Let's take a look now at the richest, most militarily powerful, most successful empire in history, the American Empire. From its earliest history, the American policy elites were concerned to eliminate competition for land on the periphery, either from the native inhabitants or from foreign imperialists. The Monroe Doctrine is the most famous pronouncement on this trend, expanding the possessiveness of American elites to the entire Western Hemisphere. U.S. government interests always trumped anti-imperialist rhetoric, meaning in practice that the U.S. government was opposed to other imperialisms, but not its own. In the Cold War, the United States was not averse to colonialism if it could be made to serve anti-communism, setting up a capitalist empire to counter the communist empire, and national identity became synonymous with leading the free world. Recognizing independence of other countries became a scattershot affair after World War II. The Philippines, India, and Israel were recognized, but a place like Vietnam was not. American policy elites have certainly not been consistent in their imperial views, for often in their history they have disdained the imperialism label and preferred to assume theirs was a non-empire. Yet, Many other Americans in the 19th century were searching for identity and embraced imperialism because they wanted the United States to be like other great powers, powers who had their own colonies. They shared with these powers the view that Western civilization had to be imposed on the non-West for their own good. But Americans were different. They dreamed of one world united in a modern, progressive, liberal economy with universal American values. Formal imperialism with colonies was ditched in the early 20th century because it was leading only to increased friction among the great powers. The civilizing mission of Americans remained, however, especially during the Cold War. Some claim that imperialism as a political force is dead, replaced by globalism, which is a cultural force and which has both destroyed cultural diversity and Americanized the planet. The American obsession with exporting its values was not consistently applied over the 20th century. After the Wilson Initiative in World War I, the rhetoric in favor of spreading democracy went on hiatus for 60 years until Ronald Reagan used it as a tactic to undermine Russian communism. Since the announcement of the Truman Doctrine in 1947, the United States' focus had not been on building democracy, but on armed resistance to communism and containment of the Soviet Union. Beginning in 1947, the CIA worked to subvert democratic elections in which communist parties might make gains. In Latin America especially, American policy was to prop up dictators and support American corporate interests. In the 1980s, Reagan embraced the imperialist notions of Gene Kirkpatrick, who thought it was admirable to support authoritarian regimes because they did not seek to control capitalism, thereby allowing American corporations easier access to new markets. The bad people were totalitarians who sought control of capitalism. Hence, Reagan's call for democracy was aimed at the Soviet Union, not Latin America, where U.S. corporations and businessmen had made corrupt deals with dictators and violated human rights. Even under Bush I and Bill Clinton, economic prospects in China trumped democratic rhetoric. It was assumed that the rising Chinese economy would somehow propel democracy forward. Promoting the American creed has been the object of evangelical fervor since at least 1945. It was imagined by its proponents that this creed of democracy and free trade would allow everyone in the world to become prosperous. But this false proposition that freedom creates wealth was based on a naive observation that the American frontier situation in which advanced white people mowed down the indigenous tribal peoples on their way to liberty and profits 
In the 1950s, the United States government tapped into native enthusiasm for the American creed and used emerging modernization theory to embark on nation building for the planet, convinced that American ideas would transform Africa and Asia. Hope was placed on local, westernized elites in a top-down approach. Until the 1970s, there was nearly unanimous agreement among public and private elites that expanding U.S. corporate interests into the developing world should be left to the private sector. The big stumbling block was fear of instability, and only the big American oil companies dared to risk investing in such regions. But they always had the backing of the United States government. The American empire has become a way of life, the American way. Americans have a long-standing imperial ethic, imperial psychology, and addiction to imperialism. William Appleman Williams was the foremost proponent of this interpretation, which saw the glorification of U.S. expansionism and conquest into a lofty vision of democracy and virtue transformed into self-deception, especially after 1945 when the U.S. government asserted a unique right to impose the American way on the whole planet. This way of life is a kind of Weltanschauung, the sum of thought patterns and actions that become a habit institutionalized to divine the character of a culture and society. Empire is the violent subjection of one people by an external power. Americans have come to believe that their way of life depends on empire, which means freedom, liberty, and security, founded on an endless supply of resources from all over the world. Americans become indignant when they are accused of imperialism and deny that the United States is or ever was an empire. Like a magnet next to a compass, trade between unequals is not exactly harmless. The American way began with the Indian trade in beads, blankets, and guns. After 1865, the main thrust of empire was in exploiting foreign markets and resources. The big push came from Republican farmers who pressed Washington politicos for an aggressive foreign policy for new markets. In 1899, Secretary of State John Hay issued the Open Door Policy to world leaders. This was American penetration of markets, demanding equal treatment of U.S. trade and finance in any sphere of influence, which included protection of interests in China, meaning gunboat diplomacy. Later, President Teddy Roosevelt believed the U.S. government must be the world policeman to protect American freedom by putting down disorder in the poor countries. Then, President Taft pushed dollar diplomacy substituting greenbacks for bullets, supplying U.S. credit and open foreign markets for American businessmen. President Wilson carried Roosevelt's notion even further by expanding U.S. military com commitments to all nations, not just the poor ones. American freedom came to be defined in global terms. Herbert Hoover, a stealth imperialist, worked the Washington Naval Conference to make sure the U.S. Navy would become equal to that of the British. After 1945, American capitalist leaders felt that the United States government had to push even more for American capitalism. The lesson of World War II was not collective security, but American domination. In September 1945, President Truman said America had to be the global policeman because every country needed a sheriff to collect money. NSC 68 in 1950 stated that U.S. government aims were to impose a new world order based on containment and subversion of the Soviet Union. John F. Kennedy, the new frontiersman, spoke of American obligations on its new frontiers thousands of miles across the ocean it was a burden only the United States could bear. Vietnam, for example, became an American frontier to invade, control, and civilize 
But what were the limits of this frontier? Did this empire have any boundaries at all? American imperialism has been discussed as a way of life, a creed, an economic imperative, and a financial swindle. Before 9-11, imperialism was also a trope for sexual domination. In the 1890s, American men were indoctrinated in the idea that empire builds character. At a time when social Darwinism created fears of race degeneracy, empire was regarded as a cure for American male weakness. Anti-imperialism was regarded as feminine and moralistic. In the 1898 Spanish-American War, American manhood became a national security issue. The unmanly Philippine males were not fit to govern themselves, according to popular sentiment. So American men had a sacred obligation to train them how to be men. The American imperial masculine ethos was a product of elite culture, rooted in male boarding schools for the rich who embarked on fanatical social boundary marking, shipping their sons off to institutions that would quickly differentiate their boys from the common herd. Such schools invented a tradition of stoic manliness and muscular Christianity in profuse imitation of English public schools. Boys were toughened up, made loyal to each other, ready to assume command, as if by right. Independence was punished, conformity praised. Violent abuse by older boys on defenseless younger boys was thought to build character. Most of these boys grew up to be lawyers and bankers in New York and Chicago. Some of them became president. The trajectory was Phillips Andover, Hill School, Choate, Groton, St. Paul's, and then on to the Ivy League, such as Yale and Harvard. Male solidarity groups reinforced imperial masculinity. Fraternity houses, elite clubs, and membership in voluntary military units, all for wealthy boys, served to validate manliness. Elite military service was the hallmark of elite political manhood until at least 1945. Men who had such elite experience thought of themselves as a warrior intellectual elite, isolated from the dirty masses, fit to rule. For men of this class, the exercise of social privilege and self-aggrandizement were self-construed as sacrifice. Imperial masculinity cults helped policymakers choose irrational paths in foreign relations. Instead of rational cost-benefit analysis, these elite men chose to intervene in Vietnam and other places on the basis of belief about prestige credibility, and resolve. Foreign policy is socially constructed, to be sure, which necessarily involves matters of sex and class. President Lyndon Johnson and his National Security Council identified manhood with violent anti-communism. It was an imperial brotherhood of power, privilege, social legitimacy, in which male identity demanded unyielding defense of social boundaries This is your Empire Historian, Frank H. Wallace, Ph.D. Thank you for listening and thinking.